Prabhupada, Paramahansa, Paribhad, Chachakacharya, Astotara Sattva Sri Sriman, His Divine Grace, Aishi Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Bo, All Glories to the Assembled Devotees, Glories to the Assembled Devotees, Glories to Sri Guru, and Sri Guranga, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading from Canto 9, Chapter 9 chapters entitled the dynasty of amsuman and this is text number 33 evam karuna basinya you got 32 oh okay that's right i'm sorry yesterday was 31 okay yarya yam kriyatem bhaksyas Tarhimam karapu vataha Najivesye vinayena Shyanam chamrita kam yata Yadayayam kriyate bhaksyas Tarhimam karam purvataha Nanjivi sve vinayena Shanam chamrita kam yata Yadaya yam kriyate bhaksyas Tarhimam karam purvataha Najive sve vinayena Shanam nam vritta kam yatha
Yadi, <coughs> if <coughs> I am <coughs> this Brahmana, <coughs> Kriyate is accepted, Bhaksya as edible, Tarhi, then Mam, me, Kada, eat, Purvataha, before that, Na, not, Jivi Sway, I shall live, Vina, without, Yena, whom, my husband, Shanam, Cha, even for a moment, Mrittakam, a dead body, Yata, like. <coughs> Very exciting part of the Bhagavatam. <clears throat> Without my husband, <clears throat> I cannot live for a moment. If you want to eat my husband, it will better. It would be better to eat me first. For without my husband, I'm as good as a dead body. Prabhupada's purport. <laughs> <clears throat> in the Vedic culture, there's a system known as sati or saha marana, in which a woman dies with her husband. According to this system, if the husband dies, the wife will voluntarily die by falling into the blazing funeral fire of her husband. Haribo. They're lining up today, aren't they? No. <laughs> Not exactly, but anyway. In fact, they have, sometimes they have a celebration. He's finally gone. How do you go? I'm free. <laughs> Things have changed a little. <laughs> Here in this verse, the feeling inherent in this culture are expressed by the wife of the Brahmana. A woman without a husband is like a dead body. Therefore, according to Vedic culture, a girl must be married. This is the responsibility of her father. A girl may be given in charity, and a husband may have more than one wife, but a girl must be married. <clears throat> this is Vedic culture. A woman is supposed to be always dependent. In her childhood, she is dependent on her father. In youth, on her husband, and in old age, on her elderly sons. According to Mano Samhita, she is never independent. Independence for a woman means miserable life. In this age, so many girls are unmarried and falsely imagining themselves free, but their life is miserable. Here is an instance in which a woman felt that without her husband, she was nothing but a dead body. Om Magyan Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya mano bistam staptitam yena bhutale swayam rupa kadam mayam dadanti swam padanti kam shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhar shivasari gor bhakta vrindam hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare hare Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari. Hmm. Without my husband, I cannot live for a moment. If you want to eat my husband, it would be better to eat me first. Without my husband, I am as good as a dead body. Hmm. Prabhupada takes the opportunity to speak about Vedic culture. <laughs> and we can see, it seems today's present society, even in most of the world, even in places like India, has somewhat changed. Changed a lot, and whereas there is a um, under an idea that uh, women can more or less assert their individuality in whatever way they want, <clears throat> and of course they give that same so-called false 
credence to men also. But we see Vedic culture is a little different. People don't like these verses because they say it's not practical, it's restrictive, it's ancient, it is, what else? It is cruel, <laughs> it's repressive, it's, in other words, using various types of terminology saying, <coughs> this is, you know, fanatical. But Vedic culture is designed in such a way <clears throat> as to very carefully study the psychophysical nature of both the man and woman based on <clears throat> Shastra, based on, because there's many Shastras that not only deal with spiritual topics, but practical, moral, and philosophical topics. So in them, like many of the Puranas describe what is a woman, what is a man, what are their different roles, what are the different types of personalities, what are their different bodily features, how even within the species, such as human species, you can, you can see a particular person, you can tell how pious or impious they are simply by their bodily features. <laughs> It's that exact. In fact, there's one Garuda Purana. It's very, very exact, describing the physical nature of both men and women in very detailed form. And it's spoken by Krishna himself, where he describes the different characteristics and qualities of people with different physical uh, expressions and physical. So, and of course, one who is versed in that science can simply see a person and understand where they're at, <clears throat> both spiritually and materially. So this is, this is very exact, because karma works in such a way as to, as to bring about a particular body that one has. The body we have is not some accident. It's actually according to our past situations in previous lives. And in this life, the expressions we develop are based on the activities we perform. <laughs> and you can see if a person looks very miserable, that means they're pretty much engaged in sinful activities. <laughs> if they look very fearsome or f fearful, you can also understand they're engaged in very horrible activities. So it's easy to see that. <clears throat> so here, um, we're understanding a little bit about the relationship between women and men in Vedic culture. Uh, when Prabhupada came to Chicago, was here in Chicago in 1974, yeah, 1974. <clears throat> Prabhupada was speaking about um, because there was, at that time there was a big outburst of women's liberation all over the country. That women need to break out of their social uh, chains and become more like their men counterparts. They should have equal opportunity in education. They had equal opportunity in job positions. They should have equal opportunity in whatever activity society is offering. <clears throat> And so there was this idea of what was called li women's liberation. <clears throat> and it was quite strong in those days. <clears throat> but Prabhupada was, made a few statements, and because of the statements he made, reporters came from different uh, newspapers, the Chicago Tribune, and also there was one other prominent Chicago newspaper, I'm not sure its name. But they came, and they were women, and they wanted to interview Prabhupada about women's liberation. Uh, this caused a quite a stir, because Prabhupada was speaking from Vedic culture, and said that the woman is always dependent on the situation. Why? Because of the natures, because of the bodily differences. <laughs> and he showed that by bodily difference, physical nature, that there is a difference 
And in that difference, there's social roles that one plays, both within the society and within the relationships with husbands and others that are conducive to moral principles, spiritual advancement, and general well-being. <clears throat> the only problem is, and I'll divert for a second, is that society is not supportive of the natural Vedic cultural rules. This is a upside-down society where no one follows rules and regulations. Where Vedic culture was, <clears throat> there were Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras, and there was roles for everyone, and of course also for the women in society. Society was, meant, was propagated and proliferated on the principle that the goal of life was to become God conscious. Here we see in Western society, and now that Western influence has somewhat pervaded the whole world, even in places like India, it's changing very fast where the role is, <clears throat> the goal in life is to become uh, economically stable or even economically advanced, and at the same time have as much enjoyment as you can <clears throat> based on your economic gains. In order to do that, one has to be able to somehow or other have as much opportunity within the social environment to express oneself in whatever way one wants. So all restrictions and role-playings have been thrown out the window based on the idea of material advancement. But we learn from Vedic culture that a society begins and develops on certain principles, which are called purusharthas. A purushartha is the, the activities of life. And what is the purushartha's dharma? Artha, Kama, and Moksha. These are what we call the activities of the human beings in, in, Vedic, in society. What is that? Well, one becomes pious, performs good activities for society, for others. And because of pious, piety, material well-being starts to become proliferated within the society by the grace of God. In other words, God opens the bountiful uh, opportunities for material advancement. And based on that, society develops. But then, as it develops, and some well, material well-being starts to come, people don't know where to put the brake. <laughs> so they keep developing materially in order to keep in, enjoying sense gratification. So the next is, is kama. Kama means to fulfill your needs. We need food, we need um, some dwelling, we need relationships with other living beings based on friendship and marriage and other social interactions. And we also require, you know, medical care and just general things to, to live within the society. So that's basic. Uh, 150 years ago, actually not 150 years, yeah, 150 years ago, the amount of what we say products on the market within society, we say back in the 1850s, 95% of those products were necessities of life, and 5% were extra. Now, this is 167 years later, now the total has changed in the opposite direction where more than 96, 97 percent of the things on the market are what we say not required. And two, three, or four percent are the basic necessities of life, which are food, clothing, housing, medical care, education. <laughs> every day, every day, some new product goes to the patent office in America for, and for sale to get approval to be on the market. So we're being bombarded by newer and more types of uh, things for, for society. I mean, you see it every day, right? There's always a new high-speed toothbrush, you know? <laughs> 
you have a, now you know they have the toothbrush. Now they have a toothbrush with a little button on it, and a, it's electric toothbrush, and you have a vibrator. You got this, that, you know. Vedic culture was you had a eucalyptic tree. You take a, a branch and you just, and then you throw it away. But nature's provided the toothbrush, and it was very effective. <laughs> So everything has become complicated, even in the basic things like that. There's 150,000 ways to fall asleep now. This kind of bed, that kind of bed, this kind of bed, this kind of bed, that kind of bed, this bed, that bed, up on the walls, you can sleep sideways. <laughs> so this is like craziness. The society has gone mad, simply pro proliferating all this useless stuff. So the social environment is not conducive to relationships. So that's why people, when they read these verses, they say, this is not practical, it doesn't work. But ultimately, within the Krishna conscious society, we're trying the best to bring back a somewhat of a Vedic culture where lifestyle is conducive to the, the relationships that are successful. Here, it shows you how a relationship becomes successful. A woman becomes dependent on her husband. A husband becomes inclined to do whatever he needs to support the wife and give her whatever she requires, both spiritually, materially, morally, emotionally, like that. That is Vedic culture. So when you ask, nowadays, when you ask a woman to be a Vedic woman, you have to also say, well, where's the Vedic men? <laughs> because they don't want to hear it. <laughs> yes, all right, I'll try being a Vedic woman, but where's the Vedic men? <laughs> so, just like they say, if you, want, if you want the women to be Sita, you have to have a husband who's like Ram. <laughs> or else, you know, it's come kind of somewhat of a crisis. But we've gotten so far away from the actual standard that no one knows their roles in their relationships anymore. Because the society proliferates and propagates and teaches, even from the time you're born, that your happiness is having more and being something within society in some social or political role. The Vedic culture tells, explains, and the Shastras explain, is that you are perfect, you don't need anything. You are by nature happy within yourself, you simply have to find that through your spiritual progress. Therefore, the only thing you need is your relationship with God. Your material well-being will follow automatically. <laughs> will follow automatically. Whereas now they've thrown out the relationship with God and material well-being and material, what we say, proliferation of so many things have become the focus in life. And no one's happy. <laughs> no one's happy. Everyone is getting more and feeling more frustrated. <laughs> right? More, more, more like that. But the living entity doesn't require anything but the relationship with God. And when that relationship becomes developed, Krishna provides automatically, naturally, for the well-being of that person, even on the material level. We might say there might be some little effort made in that level, in that direction, in order to bring that about. But now we've become focused on that as the only thing, our material happiness, well-being, facility, position in life. So society is upside down. And Prabhupada said it's a, it's a rakshasha society. <laughs> What's women's role in today's society? They're sex, sex objects, that's all. They're portrayed as the field ground for the man to enjoy his lust, that's all. So women are exploited in today's society very badly. They have become a cheap labor force. So if you want to get someone who's is, can do things in your whatever work occupation you have, you hire women, they'll take less money. And at the same time, you know, then they're also become, what we say, opportunities for other men to associate with them and also exploit them. So the relationship between husband and wife is very 
is a lot of times jeopardized by a woman's independence in the, in the workplace because she's associating with other men. And I've seen that, and I've seen it even happen in Krishna conscious society. So, you know, so the women, so Prabhupada, when he came here, he said women's liberation is a plot by men to break the bonds of women's social strictures so they can become more and more opportunities for prostitutes. That's what Prabhupada said. So rather than giving them a chance to grow according to their natures and their roles, they're being thrown into a situation where you can do anything you want because now you're free. <laughs> but that means you're free to be exploited more and more. <laughs> yeah. Because this is the nature of a man. A man wants to enjoy a woman and he will do, you know, he has that propensity. And so now we see there's so much literature. And where are all the problems in society? Broken relationships. <laughs> it's the foundation for all the problems in society, broken relationships. Divorce. I don't know what the percentage is now. Maybe some of you know. What is the divorce rate in America? 60% after first marriage. And generally people who get divorced once, they get divorced twice, and usually sometimes three times. And it was up to 70% back in the 1980s. <laughs> so, but now it's not, there's no accurate account because people don't even get married anymore. They just live together. I know some devotees that say, yeah, we don't want to get married, but because there might be a danger having a divorce. So that way we don't have to go through all the legal hassles. So society is, law, is really so far away from the ideal situation. And when you try to put women in your right role, in their right role, you also have to put society back into a better situation. You also have to put men into their right roles also so they can understand what it means to take a responsibility to take care of a woman. <laughs> Otherwise, it's unnatural like that. It's unnatural. And what is a man's responsibility? A man's responsibility is to establish himself in his Krishna consciousness and provide for the woman. Material and spiritual like that. A man, because society creates such a high standard of living, it's so hard to live in today's society, when people get married, they're both in the workforce. And I see, I see like men, they work all day, but their wives also work. So when they come home, there's no one to give them the, the support they need after a hard day's work, because the woman needs the support too. She's out there in the workplace too. So I've seen situations where the, the relationships get really weak because the roles are not being played properly. A woman, can, when she supports what her, man, her husband is doing by giving him affection, attention, and service, then he's, as Prabhupada said, then he is inclined to do anything to make his wife happy and nicely situated. But when he doesn't get that, sometimes he feels he needs to look for that same thing in other areas. And then the relationship starts to become challenged or weaker like that. A man's role is to, it's mentioned in the uh, Dharma Shastras, uh, it's called uh, Pati Dharma, and for a woman it's called Patni Dharma. Patni means wife, pati means husband. So what is the what is the pati dharma? Pati dharma means a man must give protection, affection, and material support. And the opportunity for that woman to engage in devotional service and guide her in that also. Like that. And the woman's role is to be there to support the man in whatever he's doing in life, and at the same time, to uh, provide whatever 
um, household arrangements. They did a survey in America. How much is a woman, how, how much is a housewife worth economically? If you were to calculate all the activities that are done with a, a housewife, how much is she worth economically? So they came up with a calculation, $45,000 a year, that she does the work of that many people. <laughs> she would be paid about $45,000 a year. And that was about 10 years ago, so you might say it's a little higher now. <laughs> so a housewife is actually glorious, but nobody wants to be a housewife anymore. <laughs> And the women don't want to be a housewife, and the men don't. The men want to live very nicely, so they throw their, they allow their woman to go into the workforce so they can make more money and buy a big house and so many things. But I've seen when a woman stays home, takes care of the kids, and a man becomes responsible, the house, the whole household becomes strong. The kids grow up nice because they get the affection of the, the wife, the the mother. And the husband has a nice wife to support him. She cooks nicely. She takes care of the household like that. And she also, we have a, they have a temple at the house. They worship the deities and she takes care of that. She's in charge. That's her place. She's in charge of the household. He doesn't have much to say what goes on in the house. She's the boss. <laughs> and then, but of course, you know, she always gets his advice. <clears throat> And then when she has a child, it becomes very difficult for her to maintain the child and do her other services. So the husband gives his emotional and physical support to help the wife, and that makes the relationship strong. I have one disciple, and she had twins. <clears throat> and uh, the twins were very much weak when they were born. So... The wife had to really, really work to make the children grow. But the husband was very supportive. And now the kids are grown up and they're very wonderful. And she always says, because my husband helped me so much, everything was became successful. So these are some of the, the things we can understand as what is the actual understanding of what we say success. So nowadays, things have changed so much. <clears throat> so, and Prabhupada says, a husband should do three things for his wife. He should give her nice clothes, nice ornaments, jewelry, and nice food. Like that. Okay? There's not too many grahastas here. We got one, two, three. Right? Three men, okay. You're not Grihas. No, I'm not saying you. Chandra, Badan Gopal, and our illustrious temple leader, <laughs> Subal Prabhu. So remember those things, write it down. <laughs> Makes the woman happy. Nice clothes, nice jewelry, and nice food. That's in the Shastras. Prabhupada writes that. And the woman should give her husband affection, attention, and whatever he needs to do his service nicely. She's a, she, it's like they say, wherever you see a successful man, you have to understand there was a, a successful woman behind him. And called the woman, he is called the better half of the man. So somebody asked, well, what about brahmacharis? What's their better half? Srimati Radharani. So you pray to Radharani and she'll provide whatever you need to serve Krishna nicely. Because you don't have to worry about all these other things. Your life is easy. As soon as you get married, things become complicated. But I'm not saying you shouldn't get married. I'm saying just be ready for whatever comes because life becomes a little bit more complex. If you stay brahmachari, then it's life becomes simple, but you have to somehow or other get over that desire to enjoy the opposite sex. And that's called the Adi, the Adi Ras perverted. 
If you, one who can conquer over sex desire can conquer the world. <laughs> but it's like an itch. Sex desire is like an itch. When you get an itch, sometimes it becomes intense. And what do you want to do? You scratch it. Well, that's normal. At least it seems to be. Then what happens? And the itch goes away for a while. But then how does it come back? Yes. And does it come back stronger? Yes. So tolerating that itch, Prabhupada said, just tolerate it. Sometimes you get an itch and you know if I scratch it, it's just going to come back worse. So somehow let me tolerate it. So when in the toleration period you're saying, oh, I want to scratch it, but I better not. <laughs> because I know it's just going to get worse. So you don't scratch it. And then after some time, you, just, you could see the effects of the itch becomes reduced. And actually it goes away after some time. So it's the same with sex desire. It's exactly like that. If you can tolerate that itch, and how do you tolerate it? By absorbing yourself and chanting the holy names of the Lord. Here's the, here's the secret to get over sex desire. Become attached to Krishna by chanting more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And then your consciousness becomes strong. And then there's a beautiful prayer by Jamunacharya, which he says, when I think, because Jamunacharya was an interesting person. He was a spiritual master of Ramanujacharya. What was his life? When he was growing up, he was a young boy <clears throat> and he was very intelligent. Uh, and then, and he was also very knowledgeable of the Shastras. So one great pundit challenged him to a, a public debate. And Jamunacharya was 12 years old at the time. And this pundit was, you know, he was a man, elderly, and he said, Oh, everyone is saying you're such a great pundit, I challenge you to a debate. So the word got back to the king and queen within the kingdom, and they, they, they arranged for a big debate, and they were there per personally to see this debate. So Jamunacharya <clears throat> started off by saying, I'm going to ask you three questions. And you have, to, you have to defeat my statements. If you could defeat my statements, then you can, you will win, uh, you will win the debate. <laughs> First question is, your mother is a barren woman. Defeat that statement. <laughs> your mother is a barren woman. It means your mother is a barren woman. <laughs> The second is the king has more than one wife and the queen is unchaste. The king and queen are both saying there. No, no, the queen is chaste and you have to prove she's unchaste. That's it. And the king is righteous. You have to prove he's unrighteous. And you have to prove that your mother is a is not a is not a is a, not a barren woman. He said the guy he got really upset. He said, "What kind of questions are that? You answer them. You think you are so intelligent? You answer these questions." So Jamunacharya says, "In the Shastras, it says that if a if a woman has one child, she's considered barren." That Shastra. So he defeated the first question. Second is the king is the sum total of all the demigods. So he represents all the demigods. So he, he, he has more than one consort. <laughs> because all the demigods are connected with demigoddesses. And the queen, she is connected with the king who is the sum total of demigods, and therefore she has more than one husband too. So she's, un she's unchaste. Now the king and queen are listening to that, and they're smiling, big smiles. <laughs> so then they said, Alabandu, Alabandu, one who conquers. 
So the, the pundit was defeated, and the king and queen were so happy that they awarded him half the kingdom. So he became king in half of, their, half of the kingdom that they, used, they were ruling in. So now he became king. And you know what it's like to be king? You have all kinds of facilities for enjoyment. So as time was going on, he was becoming a little degraded. The royal happiness, all the facilities. And he started to deviate from his spiritual principles. This was Jamunacharya. And as he was growing up, more and more he was becoming debauchy, licentious, engaging in all kinds of sinful activities. Now his spiritual master, Manmuni, was watching this. And he was concerned to somehow or other bring his disciple back. But he knew he couldn't approach him and ask because he knew he wouldn't do that. But every day the king would ask his servant to go to the market and buy the vegetables for his lunch. And so the servant would go to the market and buy whatever the king wanted. And then he would prepare the lunch and give it to the king, which was, you know, Jamunacharya. <clears throat> So this uh, spiritual master came up with an idea. Now there's a particular type of vegetable, I don't know the name it's mentioned, that if you eat this, your mind becomes peaceful. <laughs> so what happened is the, his spiritual master would meet this person who was going shopping for the king in the marketplace and say, I have this for the king. Give him this and cook it, he'll like it. So the, 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 uh, the, his servant said, oh, okay, so he took it and he prepared it. And the king liked it really much, very much. So every day, this, his spiritual master was meeting this person and giving him this vegetable. So this went on for months, months and months. And the king was loving this vegetable. Make it every day for me without fail. So after some time, now then Manmuni decided not to show up one day and not to give the vegetable. So he didn't show up and the person couldn't get the vegetable and so he came back and couldn't prepare it that day. So Jamunacharya said, well, what happened? Now, you know, why didn't you make that vegetable today? Well, he said, every day this man gives me this vegetable and he didn't show up today so I couldn't get it. He said, what man? He said, well, every day I met this nice man in the marketplace and he wanted just to make, give you this vegetable. He said, who's that man? He said, bring him to me. I want to meet him. So then he brought him to him and he found out it was his spiritual master. <laughs> so when he saw it was his spiritual master, he paid his obeisances. At that time, after eating that vegetable for months and months, his mind was a little changed. And he was able to listen, and his spiritual master brought him back. At that point, he again, he gave up his kingdom and again became the famous Jamunacharya. Now, after that, he writes how he used to be so attached to sense gratification in the form of sex life, that when he thinks about it now, his lips curl in disgust and he wants to, as Prabhupada said, spite. It's supposed to be spit, but Prabhupada says, I spite upon it. <laughs> so Prabhupada quotes that verse that Kojamunacharya spoke many times to say that when, when one gets a taste for Krishna consciousness, the lower taste is gone. But it doesn't go without that higher taste. So one has to get that higher taste. And that higher taste comes by chanting the holy names of the Lord reading Prabhupada's books and engaging nicely in devotional service. Gradually that taste will come. But yeah, everyone struggles with sex desire because it is, it is the way the world goes on. No one can give it up. It's not possible. It's so strong. And it comes in different forms. Even if one gives up the gross forms, it comes with profit, adoration, and distinction, wanting to be a great, and wanting to be honored, wanting to be facilitated, wanted to have followers. Or... So that's the subtle form of sex desire. And if one doesn't re free themselves from the subtle form, then the gross form can reappear. 
Because just like if you take a weed and you cut it, you may cut it nicely and there's no weed, but then because the root is still in the ground, eventually the weed will grow back. And so Krishna consciousness not only gets rid of the external sinful activities, but uproots the sinful desires through the power of one's practice of devotional service. Like that. That's the, po that's the power. So, and then one can execute Krishna consciousness in a spontaneous way. And that's the goal ultimately. So here, back to the verse, we have an understanding of relationships based on what is the ideal. So in our Krishna consciousness society, we see that Prabhupada has allowed men and women to do practically all the same services. But he wanted us to understand what it meant to associate. So association is based on the principle of service and not in the principles of enjoyment. So in that association, the mood is always to serve. And the vision is, just like Prabhupada was asked by one woman, Prabhupada, you are saying that a man should see a woman as mother, but how does a woman see a man? And Prabhupada said, one word, son. <laughs> Son, he gave it the other, the opposite. Now, a woman sees everyone except her husband, as every other man as her husband, except her husband, as son. So the mood is more like nurturing, caring, but not exploitation or sense gratification. And then the opposite is a man sees a woman as mother. There means is a sense of honor and respect that go to the women class. Except his own wife, of course, that he sees that's differently. So this is Vedic culture. So we still have to set up a social environment. We're working on it in order for, for things to work. Because the Vedic culture is the ideal culture, which allows for spirituality to grow. When the material situation is disturbed, the spiritual practice also becomes affected. So one has to what we say, see what I need on the material level to organize my life where my mind is peaceful, and then I can execute devotional service nicely. And that's up to the leaderships, that's up to the society to provide the environment for these things to grow. When the devotees try to do it on themselves, they may have a little success, but without community, it's very, very hard and practically impossible. And we find devotees come and devotees go. We have a high turnout within our society of devotees coming, becoming enthusiastic, and then after so many years, there's, you don't see them anymore. Or they come once a week on Sunday. So we don't want, we want to, as Prabhupada said, anyone who comes should have the maximum amount of opportunities to grow and therefore, education, according to ashram, is also very, very important. But so therefore, we have to understand what it means to play our role, both materially and spiritually. The roles have to be done both. There's a material role, and that's called vanashram. And there's the spiritual world, which is, that, that's varna, and then ashrama is... The, how we cultivate our practice of Krishna consciousness according to either brahmacharya, grihastha, vanaprast, or sannyas, like that. <clears throat> and now we're trying to also see how to evaluate devotees according to their natures and engage them in service accordingly. This is Prabhupada's program. 1974, Prabhupada said, uh, he changed. He said, just chant Hare Krishna, Van Ashram is not possible in this age. In 74, he said, he said, chanting Hare Krishna is not so easy. Now we must establish Van Ashram. <laughs> he says, if it was so easy, why are people going away? Why are people going away? 
because we don't have the social environment to, to keep people engaged nicely where they can fulfill their needs on both levels. Well, this, this is what the Vanashram system is about. And it's, it's most perfectly executed in a rural environment, such as farm communities. It can also be done in cities, but in cities it has to be done in a communal way. <clears throat> in other words, devotees have opportunities to associate with their different ashrams regularly and strengthen those ashrams. Grihastha associating with Grihastas, the Brahmachari associating with Brahmacharis, where there's education and how to become a Grihastha, how to become a Brahmachari, how to execute our services nicely. We can read the books, we get the ideas, and we practice it. But without community support, it becomes practically impossible. One of, the, one of the outs that brahmacharis have, they have one advantage, is they can travel and preach. <laughs> because the brahmacharis just stay in the temple all the time. It's very difficult to them, for them to remain brahmachari. Extremely difficult because of the environment. Therefore, brahmacharis, if they want to stay strong, they have to learn the shastras and preach. Not only learn, but preach. Like that. It's brahmacharis mean preachers. And householders should be able to support the, the temple environment and not so much the brahmacharis have to be fundraisers. It's up to the grihastas. And of course, we see that where those who are in grihasta life, they're nicely situated in their material occupation and they can support. But then again, raising children and... Uh, Finding occupation that doesn't destroy one's spiritual life is practically impossible in this age. <laughs> so, therefore, Prabhupada wanted this society to be a communal society. Where we can have city temples, but every city temple should have a rural community connected with it. He said, make devotees in the city and send them to the farms. <laughs> like that. And if you're living in the temple, you should be preaching somehow. Or if you're doing your service, you should be doing your service 24-7. Because if you're not fully engaged when you're in the temple, you'll just get bored and you want to sleep. <laughs> I know, I lived in the temple for <laughs> so many years. And you have to be really, really enthusiastic to keep yourself really engaged. For the pujaris and the cooks, they're fixed. But if those who are not doing that service, it becomes very, very difficult to maintain. So work together and establish uh, different uh, programs for education of brahmacharis, for education of grihastas, that allows that association. Through the association and the education, one becomes fixed, stronger. Okay, so we got off a little bit on the uh, topic. But here it's basically talking about Vanashram. What is the role of a woman and how it is somewhat in line, it's in line with her psychophysical nature. You have to remember women are different than men. <laughs> They're different. Prabhupada would say when he was here in 1974, you want to be equal, okay, then you sometimes get pregnant and your husband should also get pregnant. You take turns, that's called equal rights, right? And of course they can't answer that. So there's no question of equal rights. There is different roles. Everyone's equal on the spiritual platform, but on the material platform there's differences. And you can't artificially create equality on the material platform. You, the equality comes on the spiritual platform. But if everyone plays their material roles nicely, then they're happy. Mm -hmm. Just like a woman grows up faster than a man. This is, I, this is proven. Why? Because of her bodily nature. Yeah, a, woman of six, a woman of 16 and a, a man of 16 is like a woman to a boy. Boys don't grow up. They, they take a long time to grow up. Why? Because their mood is to enjoy 
And a woman's mood is to become more stable and find some kind of relationship in life where she can have family and grow and then develop in her spiritual life. But men, they want to, you know, you know, try everything first, and when everything doesn't work, then they get married, right? <laughs> it's usually like that. <laughs> but women can't do that because it's too dangerous. They can, their situation doesn't allow them to, to do that, and otherwise they could be victimized badly. So that's why women grow up naturally faster than men. <clears throat> it's a great, that's why it says that marriage is usually a woman is 16 and a man is 24. Prabhupada said that's the ideal connection in age. 16 to 24, about five to eight years difference is the ideal. And sometimes it's less, but that's fine. It's less. Okay, I'm just giving you some social things that Prabhupada talks about in the Shastras. Any questions? Comments? Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, you mentioned it in the class, and I wanted to ask you to see if, uh, what is your thoughts to go a little deeper on this um, uh, situation that in one sense, as you mentioned, Shira Prabhupada is en encouraged to engage both men and women in, you know, the service of mm. the mission and the service of Krishna. And then uh, we have that also according to their propensities, we have uh, both men and women who have a propensity to be a intellectual or brahmana or administrators like that they have they all we all have that type of nature um, um, and then those you have you know women taking within our society position of administration position as teachers positions as a business persons and you know they're quite effective you know and in 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 that type of work so what we find also in our society is that it's a similar problem that the you know society out there has in terms of um, the effect that that may have in family life because you know what One. happens? The, the roles change. Ah. The roles change is that women, because they have to take care of the children, if they have to do the administrative work, then the man has to come in and also support and have to take care of the kids also. <clears throat> so the, the roles don't change completely, but then there's an overlapping like that. So that's good when the, when the child is pretty much grown up. When the child is in the early ages of life, needs needs a mother, needs a father. Or else that makes, for the child, even if he's a good kid, he grows up somewhat emotionally dysfunctional. Because they need, especially for the first five years of life, that the child needs constant association with his mother. Constant. And then he'll grow up nicely. That love and care that the mother gives in the early age is foundational to the success of the child. That's the formative years of that child's growth. And with the support of the father and the love of the mother, the child grows up nicely. It has everything they need to grow up nicely anyway. And then as you can see, we're not, we don't say women shouldn't play these other roles, but usually comes later on in life. If they, they try to do that there, just like Prabhupada wrote to one of my god sisters, Arundhati, you can read it. She wrote Prabhupada a letter. She said, I have, I'm worshiping the deities, and I also have a, a two year old child, and I'm finding it very difficult to do my service and to take care of my child. Prabhupada's response was, Stop your deity worship. Child worship is more important than deity worship. 
That's a direct statement, exact statement. He says, these children are sent to us by Krishna. They, should, they have to have the care they need. And then Prabhupada went on. That was a letter to Arundhati, 1968. That letter is there. So, yeah, Prabhupada wanted the women, the mothers, to give their children whatever they need to grow up nicely. And, of course, later on, Gurukul came in, and that was a whole different thing. But still, kids need parents, both father and mother. Not two fathers, <laughs> or two mothers. <laughs> Yeah, so that, yeah, we don't deny that women have propensities, but still their first responsibility, if they have children, is to the children. That's the first responsibility. When a child grows up more, or maybe when he reaches his teenage years, then there's some leadway where the woman can do more things with, within the environment that allows for the family to go. To, to go on. And you see there's a lot of adjustment in these families who know to try to balance economic needs with family responsibilities to each other, with devotional service. It becomes so complicated. So complicated. Unless that both of those devotees are strong in their own spiritual life, it, usually things go down because they have to keep their spiritual practice foremost along with all their material responsibilities and women are not good under pressure like men are they break <laughs> they can they break they can break easy and if they don't break they become very angry when they're put under pressure and then they explode yeah is that my word correct? Yeah. So, men can take pressure because they know how to deal with it. It's just the way they are. And they can divert it or deal with it. But women, women can take pressure up to a certain point. From the outside, that is. And I'm not talking about within the family. They're good at taking pressure in the family. Because they have to have that love within that environment. But when they have to deal as an administrator with people in general, and just outside, it's they can't handle that pressure. They usually break. My Chandra, is that correct? And Chandra's wife is extremely strong personality, and she is very qualified. Yeah, the, the example that you're using, um, you know, personally, I've actually seen that uh, the breaking. Overwhelmed with trying to manage so many things, but that that mentality is situated because of I need to be independent, I need to do this, or there's a situation where they've had to do it for so long. So it's a lot of a lot of stressing in the situation. So I was thinking the question I was having in, in, in three parts. One, you have symptoms and symptoms we have symptoms symptoms, symptoms uh, in Kali Yuga symptoms of Kali Yuga one being uh, the situation with marriage and, and, and independence and things like that and then there's the uh, within the within the devotee family within the devotee family then I was thinking of the uh, Varnar Ashram system um, the Prabhupada wanting that to be applicable for devotees or general society or we're supposed to set an example so the general society can kind of pick up from us well we have to start from where we are right you can't make van ashram happen outside you have to start, have to have to have it here and then once you develop it and then you can pr propagate it right right but then it'll look a little different because we're following the ashrams so we, we want to set up a society where people can uh, engage in their varna. Prabhupada said varna first, ashram second. Right. right. But for us, it's simultaneous. We've put ashram first. Yeah. So I, I was thinking in this way, we have these symptoms, you know, in Kali Yuga, 
And then I was thinking the cause, like there's a main, main cause. And I, it's one thing that came to mind was cow killing. And maybe because of that, uh, uh, because of cow killing, maybe a number of these things, they become symptoms of, of the cause. I, just your comments on that. You mean cow killing? Well, cow killing is the main cause. And then we symptoms are relationships, families breaking. You well, know, cow things. killing is sinful. And wherever there's sinful, you can't expect happiness to be there. A society, this society is, is struggling. Why? Because one of the big cow killers in the world. They're trying to make things better here, but they'll never will until they stop their two things, abortion and cow killing. And these, this, this is, has seven heavy sinful reactions upon the society as a collective force, not just individual. It affects everyone. Yeah. So therefore, everything on every other level is going to be challenged by you know, sinful activities, because sinful activities create a type of reaction that makes everything and that people suffer because of that. So now they're dealing with the suffering of the sinful reactions, so it's practically impossible to set up an ideal society within that. It's not possible. It is. Yeah. So what for us, what do we address first? Do we deal with the symptoms or the cause? You mean within the devotee? Well, you know, we were talking, you know, um, creating a, uh, an environment where women can feel supported. The men are actually, they're providing um, gifts, the things that the woman needs, uh, trinkets, you know, jewelry, and then food, you know. I mean, so, I'm, or is it just the combination of things you do together? Is it isolated? Do I just deal with that piece? And I think our pro, our thing is our 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 vanashram is daivi vanashram, mm -hmm. so it's spiritual vanashram. That means everyone should try to become Krishna conscious. Right. Then we can work through all these what we say material dichotomies and make the best of. Them. Mm -hmm. When that's there, then the strength you get to deal with and the intelligence also. To what we say, bring in the lack, bring in the support that's needed due to material lack. Mm. We don't have the ideal material situation, nor can we create it. But we can become Krishna conscious and somehow uh, be, rise over that. But generally, from the Vanashram point of view, devotees need to be engaged in such a way that they can fulfill all their needs through the engagement. And what does that mean? That means, Vanashram means propensity. So we have, Prabhupada started the movement by training everyone to become Brahminical. But now we're seeing the need that we need Kshatriyas also. We also need Vaishyas. Sudras don't require training, but they do have occupations. <laughs> so therefore, that's why we're becoming stricter in giving second initiation because people have to have developed Brahminical qualities. And Brahminical qualities come by two things, training and education. Learning the service of becoming a, of, of a Brahmin and at the same time, what is that, that philosophical knowledge that is required? And same with Kshatriyas, Kshatriyas also. And Vaishyas too. So when we start engaging people according to their nature, then you'll see how this society will blossom. I mean, it's like somebody comes in the temple and we just give them a service to do. In the beginning, that's fine. And that should be, that's, that's okay. But after a while, a person, it's up to the leaders within the, the temple and the spiritual masters to see the nature of their disciples and then start engaging them accordingly. And what happens when they don't do that? Then people go out and get jobs. Because <laughs> they're not happy doing devotional service. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, you had a question? Yeah, yeah I, I, have, I have a question. Yeah, these microphones. I have, I have a question. Hare, Hare Krishna. And it's kind of... It's like a, it's a question that's like around a long time. It's, there's this culture within this 
some of the older devotees too, but mostly the second generation that grew up within Krishna consciousness, there seems to be um, a lot of people who don't want to be either brahmachari or a grihasta properly. And maybe there's um, a culture of disgusted, being disgusted by women and making insults even to their face. And sometimes even within a lecture, there will be like hidden insults. So how within this, this kind of mood can, can there be men who protect women? And, and if there aren't going to be, uh, shouldn't we expect women to be independent within Krishna consciousness? Yeah, that mood is, has to be removed. <laughs> that mood is polluting everything. Yeah, if that mood is there, that the thing is, Vidya Vidya Vinaya Sampane Brahmani Gavi Hastani Suni Jaiva Saparke Cha Pandita Samadarshana. One should treat everyone as part and parcel of Krishna. That means everyone, a devotee gives respects to everyone, no matter what their position, based on the position, of course, and not demeaning people or criticizing. If there's some issue, that can be discussed in an intelligent way. But finding fault with people's situation and then criticizing just, it's not Vaishnava, and it just pollutes the whole atmosphere. And people want to go away after a while. Yeah, I actually had one disciple, and she was complaining that devotees, brahmacharis in the temple were demeaning the women. And so she stopped coming to the temple. And then eventually, because of that, she stopped actually be, became less and less in her own practice because the temple for her was important. But she couldn't stay in that environment. So that we have to show respect. The thing is, what happens, and this is what happens, I think Vishaka, Mother Vishaka, she can, she, she addresses this in her book a lot. If you read her book, she addresses this situation because that was there in the early days. A lot that... Because men were becoming sannyas and brahmacharis, their attitude towards women was strong aversion. And that gave a negative uh, outlet towards other, to the women, and therefore the women were criticized, pushed aside, demeaned, and they went through a lot. They went through hell, the women in our movement. But the thing is, what kept them going was Prabhupada's presence. <laughs> was Prabhupada's presence. So now, but the understanding is that aversion is another side of attachment. So when one has a negative attitude because one is afraid of becoming attracted to something in order to protect them, they develop the, the negative side. Then that causes a, that causes a breakdown in, in, in community and relationships. So one should associate properly and one should avoid association according to ashram, but at the same time, one should not see another person's ashram or another person's body as a cause of becoming angry or upset. <laughs> and women also have to know how to behave, not to agitate that. <laughs> so it's coming from both sides like that, like that. When Prabhupada, when one time the devotees in New York, they stopped allowing the, ten, the women to chant Jop in the temple. And they said the women cannot chant Jop in the temple, they can go someplace else and chant Jopa. So they, they removed all, and Prabhupada found out, and he, he was quite upset. And he said, if the, the brahmacharis are agitated, they can go to the forest, and he said. <laughs> That's basically what he said. But that was there, strong in the old days, you know. I was also part of that environment for many years. But it, after a while, one has to see, or grow, mature in, in Krishna consciousness, where they see that everyone is spirit soul, and therefore there's a certain etiquette, and this is the important part. There's a certain behavior that one should conduct oneself in the association of the opposite sex. And that etiquette is different according to relationships. So husband and wife have one etiquette. Uh, so brahmacharis and ladies 
within the temple have one etiquette and brahmacharis with people outside who are ladies is another etiquette. So it's all based on a certain behavior. Now behavior is an expression of a certain mentality. And if we don't read the books and understand what that mentality is and try to create that mentality, then we just will act and react back to based on situations. But this is human nature because generally men are attracted to women and women are attracted to men. But now we have to become attracted to Krishna. <laughs> That's the whole thing. And then our relationships with each other will be more normal. And not exploitive or what we say selfish. <laughs> so it comes from both sides. I was recently in a temple where the women are told to go to a very small balcony to chant and they're also told not to chant in the temple room. Yeah. And, there, and, and then while I was up there chanting, just walking back and forth across the balcony, a man came up and told me that I was making too much noise with my footsteps. Well, yeah, I mean, these things go on. Yeah. I, mean, it's, 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 I mean, there's little things happening all the time, everywhere. Mm -hmm. But we need to create the proper consciousness. To deal with the incident is, of course, important, but the incidents won't stop until the consciousness changes. Mm -hmm. As I'm reading the Bhagavatam, we see that particular emphasis for the uh, Sri Dharma or the Dharma of a woman is service to the husband in terms of when the husband departs this world, what was mentioned in the purport, we hear a lot of uh, these glorious kings and what's being brought to our attention is that the wife, her means of perfection was to follow the husband. Now that's a very, from our perspective today, it's quite a severe, so, but that, that it, Prabhupada indicates that like this was how the woman achieves perfection because she follows her husband and she achieves the same destination as him. Now, it, how do we understand that in terms of modern, how did Prabhupada present the, the dharma well, for women? The idea is that if a woman loses her husband, then she can put on white and go to a holy place and and execute devotional service there. She's a widow now, and she could go to Vrindavan or any of the holy places and take up devotional service. They can also live in temples, but they should put on white, like that, that's all. And they should be respected as being a widow now, that's all. And they can perform devotional service. We don't follow this, you know, sati right. Sati Marana, as is mentioned here, yeah. you would be it would be criminal. Mm -hmm. What happened was in 1955 in India, the Sati right was officially repealed as a legal thing. So, could before then, women actually stopped doing that, but then the society was forcing the women to do it. And that became a real problem. So, in that fort situation, it was completely unnatural. And therefore, and then it became a protest, and then the whole thing was outlawed as a, as a law now. So we don't follow that at all, or even consider it. But generally, a woman will not get married again. So even now, what we find in our society, when a man leaves early in life, for whatever reason, he's either taking sannyas, goes away or dies, the woman is still young. So now I know what goes on is that the ladies now are looking for another husband. And to say they can't find another husband, according to Vedic culture, that's considered to be a, a breach of etiquette and, pro and improper behavior. But it's going on in our society is acceptable because the women need that or else they can't continue on in their devotional service. 
You can talk to some of our senior ladies, I won't mention, and they'll tell you about these situations because they know exactly how it's happening. So some of the senior ladies are helping the junior ladies who have lost their husbands for whatever reason, again, get reestablished in married life. And they say a lot of times they, their life becomes successful. In the next, in other words, they take up Krishna consciousness again and they find a nice husband. So where's the standard? Generally, you find different things. Some people say it's a, they should be married again, and then you have many of our devotees who say they're, they're prostitutes if they get married again. So the, um, the important thing is what, is what is best for their Krishna consciousness. That's the important thing. And that has to be evaluated properly. That has to be evaluated properly. The class is becoming more full now after an hour and a half later. It's, it's getting better. <laughs> okay. It's a hot topic. So we can't force these things and the GBC hasn't regulated this thing, although Prabhupada's books say, you know, a woman should only get married once. The GBC is not force, forcing that as a, as a, re, re, you know, as a requirement. But when a woman gets on in age, say she's 40, 50 years old and she loses her husband, what would be the benefit of getting married at that time? Better just to go to a holy place or stay in a temple. That's called Vanapras for a woman. She makes her life the deity where she goes and she serves that deity to the end of her life and then she goes back home, back to Godhead. If, if, the, if the husband departs. Some situations the son is there and some situations the son is not there. But usually the son is grown up by that time. If the son is not grown up, then it's her duty to take care of her children, even in that situation. That's why a lot of times the women will get, want to get married again. I think Chandra can answer that question better than I can. So he's a living example of success. So. I don't want to, I don't want to open up your private life without your permission so you can say a few things maybe. Well, I'm 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 actually working on a success. I can't say I have it. It's a, it's a work in process. I never think it's successful, but I have so much support, you know, from you and other Vaishnavas. But what I can say um in my experience and in, in some counseling that I've done, um, I see oftentimes that uh, the biggest thing, and it's, it's true for men, we're all seeking shelter and we need so much shelter that um, because of our psychology, and you can see it more sometimes, uh, depending on the way the person's brought up, male or female, that they get into situations and there's not a lot of support. You started out with the same house Prabhupada indicated how uh, men are exploiting women in certain situations by promoting this, this ERA. So we see a lot of these women uh, who don't have the shelter that they need. And then we also see the young men that are growing out of these relationships. They don't have the uh, support they need from men so that they can learn how to model. So you find some of the propensities that the young boys are extremely lazy. They don't have an ability to do basic things to take care of themselves. And then when they get out on their own, they're having so much difficulty. So now we're also seeing a symptom as uh, that the young men, they're in their 30s, 35, 40 years old, they're still living with their, their, their parents or their mother. Or, or on their own. They're, or their own, yeah. Or they're living with groups of people and that there's no sense of responsibility. So to some degree, what we're really lacking 
or uh, real men, Vaishnavas, that can really provide the necessary guidance. It's a team effort, but some, with this, our society as it is today, you only see women leading, things like that, so there's well, not you see the balance. The, the dichotomy is that we haven't provided the social environment. Right. Because even the education is there if you don't provide the environment for them to practice. So then they stay outside and just wind up getting jobs. And then in that situation, they're always in association with women, although they're never married. So their, mind, their minds can never be peaceful in that situation. Not possible. Yeah. So that's why Van Ashram, that's why Prabhupada said it, and now we're trying to do it, is we've got to set up these Van Ashram societies. That gives both the education and the, the social environment where the education can, and the s devotional service can be executed. Right now we're just dealing with a dysfunctional system and trying to patchwork it up this way or that way. But then people always gravitate towards their own personal interests when that happens. And then a lot of times their spiritual life gets sacrificed because of that. Yeah. Yeah, one other note, just from my work in prisons, I'm working with a lot of men. I, I see a lot of things that they're lacking in terms of uh, mentioning respect having respect for, for women. Well, that's the, that's the material society. Yeah. Well, that's everywhere. Yeah. Even within the, what we say, the free persons. And, and oftentimes in our society, we, we're in, influenced by those things uh, that, that are going on. And then you can see there's spillover. And so... Yeah, uh, because people who come are coming out of that society. Yes. And then they join the Hare Krishna movement. They carry that with them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, we, I, I want to ask your advice and your thoughts. Um, one thing that we're working hard is to establish an educational center here in the temple. The educational system for the man is, is traditionally is very strong. We have, we have a lot of uh, um, resources and, and, you know, and places and you know, people have done it throughout you know, to train brahmacharis. And, um, Philosophical education or, or? Philosophically and actually also we have an idea of, of how to teach of, people to serve to services serve. and in, in one sense is the idea like Gopulananda uh, and some of the devotees were working on that uh, is to give the devotees the students the tools by which they can be successful in Christian consciousness so meaning that they have to have the spiritual as well as some understanding of, of how they can make a living if they're going to move into Grihastha Ashram that most of them will do. So uh, we have, a, we have an, an idea that is fairly clear. Now we have to do the same thing for the female devotees that are coming. We have to, cre we have to be able to, 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 to create a, that same system that will give them the tools by which it can be successful too. Now, Prabhupada in the purple, he mentions, you know, very clearly and, and throughout, you know, his teachings that the importance of teaching our female devotees, you know, to, to, to have that sense of... A, Dependence. Yeah, the, that nature, the nature that, 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 that makes them happy. Prabhupada mentioned at the end of the purport that here is an example of a, what makes the nature of the woman that they can be happy, otherwise they will be miserable, Papa said. Well, the basic principle is dependence on a man. Yes. So or if she's living in the temple, depending on the temple authorities to, to, re, to give her whatever she needs. Yeah. Now, if we put a system of education, we have to teach that principle. And uh, so, well, that prince, that's there within their nature. You just have to f provide for it. 
And you, if, this, if it's not provided for, then she'll go somewhere else to find it. Say that again, Maharaj. You have to provide for that, for that, the woman to get whatever they need, along with the education, the support, the emotional, physical, and material support. <laughs> That's where Van Ashram comes in. <laughs> You can do it. You can set up an educational system here and you can educate them in that. But then again, you also have to have one, they're ready to get married. What do you do? Do you allow them to go outside and look or their hunt within the temple, which creates... Or do you have a system where you can match boys and girls up according to, you know, you know, recommendations by authorities, approval by authorities, and astrology. So, there has to be a system to support the education. Otherwise, the education remains theoretical, like that. And people will come for the education, but if they can't practically carry it out, then, they, you know, then the material society has everything, but it's dysfunctional, so they go out there trying to find that. <laughs> Uh, that's why, I mean, Shiva Ram Maharaj, he's, he's full force on this. He's trying to do Van Ashram in Hungary. He's, he wants to do it perfectly, so he says, if I, well, we can establish it here, then we can have a prototype as a model for all over society. So he's writing a series of books. The first book was Varna's. Now he's writing on ashrams. And that's his main focus now, you know, amongst all the other things he does. So, and this Prabhupada's instructions was there in 1976, Prabhupada, 77, Prabhupada said, we have to set up these far communities based on the Van Arsham system. Otherwise, our society will not, can, not, not proliferate. We'll have a lot of people who are just uneducated and doing different things, that's all. The spiritual substance will be weak. Because people, if they're challenged in a material way, it affects their spiritual practice. You gotta have food, you gotta have a place to shell. People have to have opportunities to, you know, grow, raise a family. GBC. In a survey, 1996, why do people leave our, leave our movement? And one of the reasons was Grihastas could not, you know, maintain within the society. They had to go out and get jobs and then focus on raising their families in a secular environment. And then what they would do is just come to the temple whenever they could. They were back in the material energy again. So, yeah, your model, I'm sure it's it's been thought out, but then you know, when in part one is the education, part two is the environment to practice that education that you're teaching them. <laughs> Prabhupada said training, not just philosophy. We all got the philosophy, we know it all, right? We read the books. Well, what is that training and what is that application of that knowledge? That has to be there. So setting up programs to bring about inspiration where these different things can develop within the community. Your education and your different models are a catalyst to bring about the actual environment. And the education is the most important, but it's only the beginning. I mean, there's a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge, but their life is dysfunctional <laughs> because they can't apply it. <laughs> that means their knowledge is not practical or not being used in a practical way. And sometimes because of the environment or sometimes because of their own deficiencies, whatever, whatever reason. So, yeah, set up these educational programs for the men and for the women, but then you have to see, that's step one. <laughs> that's step one. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense?
Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Maharaj. I just had a quick uh, comment about um, <clears throat> Van Ashram and uh, the importance of establishing the educational systems. And uh, I'm coming from the uh, New Taliban Temple, which is a rural farm community. And so me to visit a temple in Chicago, which is a city temple, and being a brahmachari, I'm like, what do I do here? You know, there's the preaching aspect going out on book distribution, but my propensity is to be out in the fields working every day. Well, that's nice. So I think it's, it's important to have strong educational systems in both parts of our movement, you know. Because Prabhupada wanted us to do both, but to have both of those facilities be really strong. And um, Yeah, or else our whatever service we're doing becomes like work if it's not backed up with philosophical understanding. We may like or have a certain nature to do a certain service, but unless we're grounded in the philosophy in a practical way, that service will sometimes, when it becomes difficult, will become a source of uh, causing us to become less enthusiastic. That's why we need both the, the philosophical and spiritual education along with the practical service. That's the balance. That's what's called vana and ashram, vana ashram. There's that nice verse from the Bhagavatam. It says that if it doesn't, if our work doesn't help spread the love of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then it's Yes, from every kevalam, yeah. Yeah. It's in the first canto, second chapter. If one's occupational duty doesn't lead to inquiry into the absolute truth, then it's all useless. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Was it Parma? What? Parma? Oh, Parma does. I, wa I want to speak to you after class. Can you just give me, you know, yes, Maharaj. give me two minutes after class? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. I love you. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question, but I don't know if the question was already asked in this forum. Uh, I was driving, I got disconnected while hearing. The question is, uh, in the earlier days, uh, when the husband dies, wife also give up their life and diving in the funeral. So, uh, later, uh, though it was a standard and it was with a free will of the wife was doing, later it was a force on the woman to die after the death of things. and. I have been getting these questions, I couldn't answer properly uh, to the people. They say that this is almost like a uh, suicide. You know, if voluntarily, if a woman is dying, it's kind of a suicide, then Vedic scripture is recommending kind of things. So, at least I said it is not, but I want to hear from you if it is not a repetition. Is it suicide or not? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that word has a particular connotation which means that when, when one is miserable <laughs> they give up their life for whatever reason but the sati right is not because it means that the ha -ha wife joins the husband according to wherever he goes so it's not suicide in that sense and that's how the sati right works in its ideal situation she follows her husband and so wherever, wherever destination he attains, she'll join him in that destination. That's what the sati right, how it works. So it's not suicide. Thank you, Maharaj. At the same time, uh, how to understand, like people ask, it's a material attachment, wife and husband, so kind of things. Is it, is it a material attachment of a wife towards husband, you know, because she cannot tolerate the separation? Well, if, if there's no spirituality in the relationship, but there's also spiritual attachment, not just material attachment. Spiritual attachment means they've been serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead together as husband and wife. And they've been nourishing each other's spiritual life along with their material needs. So there's an attachment that develops in what, where, there's, where there's real love that develops. Yeah. And the idea of a woman, she'll think, there's no other man in my life for my husband. That's all there is. He's my whole world. That's what it says here. Without my husband, I cannot live for a moment. That's the Vedic wife. She thinks like that. And she only wants to be, even if he leaves, she goes with him. 
the like that. That's 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 the actual understanding. But when women were forced to do that, the whole thing became corrupted, and what we say, cruel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not it's, it's not suicide. Mm -hmm. It's like you have the example of when Pandu died. So Pandu had Madri and Kunti. So he had two wives, and there were five children amongst the two wives, the Pandavas. So Nakul and Sahadev had mothers as Madri, and the other three were sons of Kunti. So the two ladies got together, and so Madri decided to follow Pandu, and Kunti stayed there to raise the children and to continue on like that. And that's what happened, yeah. Hare Krishna. Um, so, as you told that whatever occupation we are doing, if it is not coming to the point where we can develop the loving devotional service to Krishna, it's just a waste of time. That's the Bhagavatam. Yes, it's a verse. Yeah, okay. So let's say the person has joined temple and he's, he has been allotted to a particular service and he likes that service and he's doing the service with the full enthusiasm and full, in the full mood of service. Yeah. Then how long it will take for him to develop the loving devotional service to Krishna because he might Well, if he's engaged in devotional service, that the verse doesn't apply to him. The idea is that that's for one who is not engaged in devotional service, whose occupational duty is to simply to propagate their own material desires and needs. That's what that verse is about. But one who's engaged in devotional service, then that's fine. But you might say, oh, he's not perfect yet. So if he stays in the process, eventually he'll become, you know, more and more advanced to perfection. So that sounds sounds fine to me. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, externally is doing very great service, but if the internal mood has not yet developed, that okay, everything should be for Krishna and Radharani. So you you're saying a particular person who is more inclined to their service, but not so inclined to chanting, associating. I'm doing this for my guru, my Krishna. That well, he, Prabhupada says, a mango on the tree, a mango on the tree. It may be green. Keep it on the tree, it'll become ripe. Stay in the process and then eventually you'll develop that. Just stay with the process, that's all. You can't criticize a person for being dirty when they just began their shower. <laughs> You have to give them a chance to get clean. So, yeah, well, maybe we're all not on the perfectional platform, but as long as we stay in devotional service, just a matter of time, that's all. So everything's there. Hmm. There's no reason to take exception with that. That's, that's fine. Doing a service with a full enthusiasm, it has been seen many times that people start criticizing the person that, okay, because you are not pure, you should not do this service because you are not pure and you may create offenses or you may disturb the people. And I'm sure they're pure, right? The people are saying that. <laughs> That's a very hypothetical situation that is not so practical at all. Anybody who criticizes anyone for doing their devotional service for whatever reason is in a wrong mentality. <laughs> the person's enthusiastic in their devotional service. Hey, that's wonderful. That's great. We like that. We want that. That's devotional service. Spiritual masters, please. But at the same time, we might say, well, okay, so maybe you need to, to spend a little more time reading Prabhupada's books or... So the associating with devotees a little more. That way you can balance everything out nicely. That's all. But the situation's ideal. 
Prabhupada said, the mango's on the tree, it's green, keep it there, it'll get it'll become ripe. If they go away, then 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 that's 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 unfortunate. But as long as they stay in devotional service. If you want to make it in this movement, just stay in it, that's all. <laughs> just stay, just go for the whole time. And then even if you don't make it to purity, even at the time of death, if you've given your heart and your best energy to Krishna consciousness, and Krishna will purify you at the time of death. He, he does that sometimes. Whatever's left there, he wipes it away because the devotee has been given everything they had their whole life. So who can criticize someone for not being pure? That's, 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 I don't know what you call it. It's just stupidity, <laughs> I think. Okay. All right. Is it time for lunch yet? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Kijai. Srimad Bhagavatam Kijai. <laughs>